Good morning. You're a little late on the draw there, Pop. I know. I know. All right. Very quickly, I'm going to run through the announcements. Starting with the pencil one. October 28th, the yard cleanup for the Andersons. Okay? Because clearly, you know, they're not going to do the yard work. And they shouldn't have to. All right, after all this time, you should not have to do some yard work. So, we all want to pray for Andy because he volunteered to do it. <laughs> if you are able to help see Andy, that is October 28th, be just before Halloween. Monday, September 12th at 6.30 is the next board meeting. I believe that's tomorrow, correct? Okay. Uh, Friday, November 18th at 7 p.m., Alex Jolt will be here for his concert. Please don't miss that. Wednesday, November 23rd at 7, Thanksgiving Eve service. All right. Are we going to eat? It doesn't say that. We have, if you're coming here on a Wednesday, we're eating. It's always food. Are you cooking? It's dessert. No. That's not my gift. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's the, it doesn't say that either. I know. It is the parade of pies. It's a pie parade. Okay? So, get your slice. Next to prayer fellowship uh, is October 4th at 6.30. So, is that the Tuesday night thing that started? Oh, my bad. I did. Sorry. I think my wife had me doing something. And I, so, you can talk to her. All right. That being said, there's your announcements. Did I miss anything? Anybody else got something you want to announce before? Uh... Okay. That being the case, you may now. Hold on a second. All right. We can go walk across the aisle and say hello to everyone. All right. Please. <laughs>
said it was a uh, good sleeping weather this morning, so I'm assuming that means he's going to talk really short. Or he's going to talk really long so that you can sleep. <laughs> yeah, I, believe me, I know. All right. Did you know the painter Vincent Van Gogh had a very large family? He had a dizzy aunt named Vertigo. <laughs> His brother worked at a convenience store. His name was Stop and Go. <laughs> he had a brother who ate prunes. They called him Gotta Go. <laughs> a grandfather from Yugoslavia. He was Yugo. He had a good, this is a good one. He had a cousin from Illinois. Guess what his name was? Chicago. Come on, that's all that one. <laughs> his magician uncle. Where did he go? His Mexican cousin, Amigo. <laughs> the Mexican cousin's American half-brother, Ringo. The ballroom dancing aunt, Tango. The bird-level uncle, Flamingo. His nephew, psychoanalyst, Ego. <laughs> the fruit-loving cousin, Mango. An aunt who taught positive thinking. Way to go. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love that. <laughs> A little bouncy nephew, Pogo. A sister who loved disco, Gogo. -go. And his and his niece who traveled the country in a van, Winnie Bago. <laughs> I know they're stupid, but man, some of those are hilarious. The Amigo one is hilarious. I think that's funny. Anyways, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And as you know, we're going to get up and we're going to sing in a second. But first, we're going to bow our heads and pray. Lord God, thank you for this beautiful day. Yeah, it's a little cloudy outside, Lord, but it's the, it's the light that you gave us today. And while many people look at the clouds as a gloomy, dreary day, I see it more of you giving us a great big hug, Lord, and letting us know that you're going to take care of everything. So today, while we worship you and we sing to you, Lord, stand beside us and, and hold us close. Keep us safe and, and, and let us feel your peace today while we sing. In your name, Lord, amen. All right, let's stand up and sing. Uh, we're going to watch YouTube one. Treating my sorrows. I don't know this one. We'll sing it loud.
fly away. Man, you 
think they have found a better place to go. <laughs> I know that. I know that. I'm just picking on you with them because. Oh, oh. Yeah, I think it's going to stick her to the bed. Yeah, it's going to stick her to the bed. All right. Anyone else? Go ahead. Joy? Thank you, everyone, for your prayers for my husband. He's home doing well. He had a stroke. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead, Jen. in that respect too. Yesterday at 7 o'clock in the morning, my son Josh, he and his significant other had another little boy. So I am a grandfather again as well. Yeah. Uh, Lennon. Yeah. Lennon. Imagine that. I'm not going there. I'm not a big Beatles fan myself, but I'm just saying. I don't know. I'm not a huge Beatles fan myself. All right, anybody else? All right, Mom, now we can hear you listen. Oh, okay. Are you going to leave it here so I can? Okay. Or do you want No. Well, then give me the list. I don't want you to read over here. Excuse us. We're having a family discussion. <laughs> we, um, we had a prayer, our first prayer meeting in a while Tuesday night, and what a blessing. I, I hope you'll all come. Um, the ladies prayer team here has seen so many terrific answers to prayer joy as evidenced by what you just said. We were on our knees and our heartbeat praying for June. Um, <clears throat> Mike and Diane have some friends um, whose daughter Amanda has spinal fluid dripping on her brainstem. Is that any better? What they have said was she went home because there really wasn't a whole lot they could do for her. So she went Thank you. Um, we have a grandson that needs special prayer. Um, the Bill Morse family, Bill passed away and went to be with the Lord this week. His funeral is Tuesday. Please pray. They're praying above all things that God will be lifted up and people will come to know him. Um, Diana is still in a little pain from her neck surgery. Um, we have some folks suffering from insomnia here in the church. If you remember to pray for them. Um, Jake is going to have some foot surgery here pretty soon. It's, it's just been a plague for him for the last three years. Would you pray that they finally get to the bottom of that? And then we had a young lady here who prayed for her school, for her. This year would be a testimony. We could pray that for all, our, all of our kids that are here. And for Les and Gina, you have no idea the fantastic lessons that take place downstairs. Those kids are learning things that many adults don't know. So pray for them, too. Um, we prayed for our church body, that we would experience spiritual growth and that we would become a, a lighthouse that reaches out to this entire community. Our time is short on this earth. Um, Jesus is coming, and we need to let them know that decisions need to be made. I hate to go from that one to this, but we may have trouble with our septic tank. So if you would, well, you know, it's on the list, what can I say? Um, would you just pray that our, our church um, physically would be um, just in the Lord's hands. We're just here. This is all his. So what he does with it, sometimes we just have to accept. Um, and then we're praying for 
some of our families with younger children who they're starting to learn things about life that are curious to them and for moms and dads that they can explain to them um, how God wants us to handle things. Thanks. You got all that I wasn't allowed to write it down. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'm going to pray for the mountain, okay, of stuff. But I don't know. It seems it seems a little odd to be not specific when you're trying to, you know, when you really want to pray for someone to just cover it in a blanket. I think that's what the the point of that meeting is for, is so that specifically. All as a group, you can pray for one person at a time. Because while your minds are all on it, that's when I think God's power is at its greatest. When you are all collectively, we are all collectively thinking about that individual or that person. It's very difficult to take a list like that and do what I'm about to do. Uh, because, you know, I've got the ones I wrote down that we want to talk about. And these are not on that list. So, you guys are going to have to come Tuesday night for that one. No, I'm just kidding. Who was, somebody was raising their hand again. Andy? Um, we ask God for requests all the time. For this, that, and the other. But he also says, if we all know it, he says thank you before we ask God. We always do, brother. We always do. We come humbly and we say thank you and graciously before we ever petition. Always. The loss of my parents. Life is short. And maybe it's time you start paying attention to see what we can do with the church body together outside of Sunday morning. No, because it's true. the rest of the world does it. No, yeah. Yep, I agree. Well, we'll pray for our church body too. Alright. So let's do that now. Let's let's bow our heads and go to prayer with all these things. Lord God, we, we come to you and we we thank you so much for the for this opportunity that we have to even breathe today. Lord, we know that we are not worthy of your love. We certainly weren't worthy that you for you to send the, your son to die for us, but you did it anyway because of that love. So Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We thank you so much for this group of people that you assembled today. Lord, we think about our, our country and the communities that we live in. Lord, many years ago, something happened in our country that was shocking. And, and, and I guess it happens all over the world, but to us it was a devastating blow. And a lot of things have changed because of it. So, Lord, I pray for our country. I pray for our leaders that, Lord, the veil of things that they tell us that you would see through and, and, and continue to turn their hearts whithersoever you will. Lord, for, for Jackie, we pray, Lord, that you would, you would bless her, that you would keep her safe, that you would give her some peace and help her heal. We thank you, Lord, that Joy's husband is okay that he's doing well. And we ask that you would continue to comfort him and Lord, show yourself in his life. From Mrs. Richards, broken hip. Lord, that's such a tough thing. We just pray that you would help her be mobile and to not be discouraged by the inability to get where she wants to go. We certainly would want her to come home, Lord. So if that be your will, we ask that that happen. Lord, we thank you for Lynetta. We remember her fondly. Pray that you would give her peace. We know that we're getting to it now. So I ask that you would just be with her. And thank you for Miss Maisley. Lord, we think about the passing on of life, but life begins anew as well. And so we've got both ends of the spectrum today. Brand new baby. And yet saying goodbye almost at the same time. So, Lord, we're covering the spectrum today. And, Lord, for this group of people, Lord, this is family. And anyone who walked through that door today is family. 
I pray, Lord, that you would sit next to each one of these people as we look for you. We look for answers from you in everything, in everyone. May they see us. Or may they see you in all of us. And in me. I want to thank you so much for this day. And again for these people. We give this all to you, Lord, in your name. Amen. All right. Ginger. Good morning, church family. Good morning. That made Jenny and me feel so welcome the first time we came to this church. And Tim's wife, Lisa, said that when she, before she read the Bible section. So anyway, did you all notice there was a blank in your bulletin this morning? Anybody know that song? Don't say it if you do. Anybody know what that could be? Okay. Well, Carol and I decided to have a little fun this morning. We'll try to make a quick pastor. Uh, we want to demonstrate to Pastor Larry we really listen to him. And uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of hints, but when I say go, or go like this, I'd like everybody to shout out the answer. And, and you too, everyone, you can play. <laughs> okay, so here's your pop quiz. Who wrote 13, could be books, letters, epistles, I understand they're interchangeable, in the New Testament? Hint number one. No, not not till I not to, Marilyn, not till I do this. Oh. <laughs> and you got to do it real loud too. Okay. Okay. Another hint is uh, this fellow knew Ananias. This fellow knew Ananias. And lastly, he had one name starting out, four-letter word, and then he had it changed to a different name, four-letter word. Now, this is his ministry I'm going to sing about, so everybody now. Paul. Good job. This indeed is about Paul's ministry. The Lord said, stand up, Paul, and dry off your tears. You must preach my gospel for many long years. Go to Damascus, the street that's called Straight. I counted on Adam, I counted on Cain, I counted on Jonah, but he was the same, I counted on Judas, but he proved untrue. Three days 
have gone by And still I can't see Here comes Ananias With a message for me He said, Brother Paul The Lord in the sky someone's willing to put themselves out there and do what she just did. I think that's awesome. It's very blessed. All right. Scripture is from Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For Jan John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the far ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Right. 
one more time, we get to stand up and sing, uh, that would be the cue. <laughs> that would be the cue. Stand up and sing. Jesus is coming again. Twice. Most people don't understand that. The Bible uses a lot of different terms for his coming. But uh, if you were raised in a dispensational type church, which is pretty much what we are, you've heard about the rapture. Well, the rapture, that's not a word that is used in the Bible. And uh, it's taken from a Latin word translated in the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is the Greek Bible translated to Latin. And uh, so that's where we get the word rapture from, and it comes from 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed, raptured. Now he's talking to the church there. But another word that you would hear about what's next, the second coming, would be the revelation, otherwise called the glorious appearing of the Lord. And there, is, there are distinctions between the two. But why is this important to us? Well, you've all heard, I, I know if you've watched any Christian TV, you, you have heard that the signs are all there. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes today. And those people lied to 
couple of things that we have to understand <clears throat> is that all of the prophecies, all of the prophecies, except for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, relate to Israel. The Jewish people. From the Old Testament all the way into the book of Revelation, the prophecies relate to Israel. They didn't see, the prophets did not see the rapture. What they did see was the first advent. Christmas. God in the flesh to the world. And if you'll read the Old Testament, there are hundreds of prophecies relating to the birth of our Savior, born of a virgin in a town of Bethlehem, on an obscure night. I don't know if Christmas, the birth of Jesus, was December 25th. Probably in October, I think. But I can't prove that. And I don't know. But we do know there were many, many signs. Prophecies that God gave to the Israelites. When you see this happen, when you see this happen. Now, I know uh, in our day today, there are a lot of girls that have gone home to mom and daddy and said, I don't know how I got pregnant. It must be virgin born. Well, we know that's not true. But it does turn your head when you hear it, doesn't it? We giggle. <laughs> the sign that the virgin has conceived, that which is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was born. There were signs for the first time. Advent. And the announcement was made by Gabriel to Mary, and then Gabriel and his host were the ones the night he was born. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. There were lots of signs for the first Advent. Well, that's pretty, pretty cool. Well, how do we know this is going to be true? We say Jesus is coming again, and we we wonder in uh, let's see, Jesus is coming again. I got it. He's coming again, and I want you to tell you. Want to tell you? Why do we know he's coming? Because Jesus said it. There were no signs. There are no signs for. <laughs> The, the coming of Jesus. So let's look at some of these prophecies about Jesus coming from the New Testament because you won't find his rapture in the Old Testament. The prophets didn't see it because they were concerned about the revelation and we'll talk about that in a bit. Well, let's take a couple looks. John 14. The Gospel of John is pretty clear. And you've heard this if you've ever gone to a funeral, and most of us have gone to more than we want. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare for you a place. For I will come back and take you to be with me. That where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus said, he's coming for us. Now, how do I know it's for us? Because he's talking to the church. This letter, the Gospel of John, presented Jesus as the Son of God in fulfillment of all those signs for the first advent. He's been here, he is here. That's a pretty powerful one. And then the scripture that we just read from the, the letter that Dr. Luke, Luke, you ever wonder when it says in my former book, O Theophilus? Well, Dr. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so he's writing another letter now, and he's telling us the Acts of the Apostles. That's the full title of the book, and most Bibles just said Acts. But its full title is the Acts of the Apostles. It's a history book, if you will, but there are some prophecies in here in, first, in the very first chapter. Jesus, after he had appeared, after his resurrection, first advent, all those signs that led up to it, it and, and he had all of that lined up before him, 
And he talked to the disciples, remember? I, in First John, and we'll get there in a minute, but I always thought it was so cool. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, he was in, we know he was in his glorified body, and he just walked in. Doors were locked. Do you think that's cool? I always wondered when I when I when I get my glorified body, am I just going to going to appear someplace I probably shouldn't be? Uh, I have a weird mind, folks, and and it, it just I always thought that was so cool. I don't know if our glorified bodies will be able to be like Jesus was, but he just appeared to them, and he was in the upper room. Thomas wasn't there, so he came back not a sign. This is just the way it happened. This is history. He came back and said, hey, Thomas, look at my, my hands. I still got the scars. Look at my side. I still have the cut. Look at my feet where they put the nails through it. Look, look at the scars on my back with the, with the, the, the flogging that he had taken. <clears throat> and uh, the disciples seen him. Then he appeared to over 5,000 people at one time. And they uh, never recanted their testimony. Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he said, no. He got the disciples. They, he had just taught them and he gave them a promise from John, the Gospel of John, earlier than the book of Acts. The Gospel of John, he told them, I'm coming back. I'm going to come back to you. He also said, I'm going to send you in my absence, my spirit. The Holy Spirit of God and he'll come upon you and indwell you. And he said, I promise that. And then he took him after he promised, says, you're not going to be alone. Now, notice Jesus, when he promised, he never said, you'll never be lonely. That's a wonderful song. I'll never be lonely again. That's not true. That's not true. Anybody here that has lost a spouse knows loneliness. Anybody here that sent your kid off to war know about loneliness. But you'll never be alone. Jesus said, I'm never going to leave you alone. I sent my spirit to be with you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to teach you. He's going to guide you into all truth. And he says all those things. And it's so important for us to understand that you'll never be alone. But now he's going. And I believe the same two men or angels, as is indicated in this, this passage, as the disciples are standing around and Jesus is rising up. Uh, and and, and he, he went into heaven and they're looking. It, it, put your mind. What do you mean? He said we'd never be alone. He's leaving. And then one of them said, oh, I remember. He said he's going to send us something. That's why we have to stay in Jerusalem. So the angels appeared, probably Gabriel and Michael. We don't know that for sure. But they said, why do you look up in the heavens? This same Jesus is going to come again in like manner as you have seen him go. Well, how did they see him go? In the clouds. In the clouds. The Apostle Paul then told us more about it in 1 Corinthians 15, and I've already uh, got to that point. And, and he says, you're not all going to die, even though it's appointed unto man once to die. You're not all going to die, but you will all be changed. And he goes on to describe, this earthly body will put on a heavenly body. This corruptible body that would, would corrupt in the grave is going to be incorruptible. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain. And that's prophesied again for us in 1 Thessalonians. When we lose someone, I always, <laughs> I'll always, that always bothers me. So I'm glad I lost my dad. I lost, so you don't lose anybody if you know where they are. I know my mom and dad are in heaven. I didn't lose them. They just moved away. And if your family knows Christ, like these disciples, hey, he's not dead. He just moved. And he sent somebody to take his place, the Holy Spirit. 
In 2 Thessalonians, Paul again prophesied. Prophesied. These are the one, two, three, four, five, six different prophecies from the New Testament that deal with Jesus coming again in the clouds for us. There are no signs. There's no signs anywhere. I, I can't tell you. I, we call it the imminent return of Christ. In other words, he could come at any moment. I would like to tell you that well, the, when this sign is fulfilled, and this sign is fulfilled, and this sign is fulfilled, then Jesus will come to get us. But there are none of those. I do know that the times of the Gentiles began back in, in, in Jer uh, Jeremiah. And uh, actually before that, when, when King Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews out of Jerusalem, sacked the temple, the times of the Gentiles began. And I know that when the last sinner repents and trusts Jesus as his Savior, the times of the Gentiles is over. And it reverts all to those Old Testament prophecies. Now, this is so important for us understand Jesus is coming again why because Jesus said it somebody said God said it I believe it and that settles it that's a wrong statement God said it that settles it and whether the world around us or not believes it or not God said it that settles it it will happen now, we believe it, and it gives us great joy and comfort that Jesus is coming again to rescue us. But I ask myself many times, okay, the first coming, and I would like, the first advent was Jesus born in the manger, or placed in the manger. And, and the, the, that's the first advent. But I like to call this the rapture when he comes for his church, Advent 1A, because he never comes to the earth. He comes in the clouds, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. And it is the conclusion of the first advent. So that's coming. But there is another coming. And those are the things that you see, you think, we think, we have signs. Oh, look at all the signs. There's wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus told us, and we'll cover this in more detail, but when the disciples ask him, because they're still looking for a king, Jesus hadn't died yet. They said, hey, Lord, when will this all happen? And what are the signs of my coming? And uh, Jesus, Jesus was very clear. He said, I'm coming in the clouds, but... When I come in the revelation to rule the world, there are some signs. And he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And always when he refers, almost always, when he refers to the revelation, when he touches ground in, in, in Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives splits, and the great armies of the world have gathered to defeat and destroy the Jewish people. When that happens, it will be as it was in the days of Noah. Well, how was it in the days of Noah? Well, you have to read Genesis. But it was a pretty wicked world. Violence. Intermar uh, intermarriage. Uh, racial unrest. People couldn't tell, well, is it a boy or a girl or something else? Gender identity. Violence and wickedness and immorality. Murders. Rapes. Incest. It was a wicked world. And God looked down and he says, oh, I'm sorry, I made this punch. But in his mercy, he found Noah. There were eight people. Noah, his wife, three sons, and their three daughters, their, their three wives. Eight people that believed God. And God, the old quartet song, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
and he landed high and dry, and that's true. But how was it? Well, let's take a look. And I've used this before. At that time in history, the world's population was probably somewhere between 2 and 8 million. We'll use the low, 2 million. 8 people. Noah found grace because he believed God. Okay. 8 people. What's the percentage of 8 into 2 million? Well, you take a decimal point, 6 zeros. Six zeros and one. There ain't much righteousness there. We say our world is, oh, it's so wicked and it's so violent and we have all of these issues around us, abortion or not abortion, and now we're going to be inundated in the election, the midterms, people talking about the, a woman's rights or whose rights. And, and I don't care for this message, I don't care. Suffice it to say the world is wicked. There's wars and rumors of wars. There's violence in our streets. Every day, every day, if we had a newspaper anymore, you'd read about somebody being shot in this little community and, and, and so on. Now, I want to ask you, is, is the world bad? Yeah. Population of Greater Muskegon is about 250,000 people. 250,000, that's nothing compared to two, 2 million. How many Christians do you know that believe God? I don't know what we have in here today, but look around you. This view. Over here is Broadway Baptist. In fact, I, I was in Russ's. There's a surprise. I was in Russ's the other day, and, and there was a lady, and I, I walked over to a gentleman and said, Hey, how you doing? And I talked about something, and she was sitting in this booth back here. She says, Oh, I go to Broadway Baptist. I'm so glad you talked, and I, I, I probably had prayed with somebody there prayed over their meal or something, and we struck up. There's Broadway Baptist, Port City Church down here. There's there's uh, Trinity Baptist over here. There's the Church of God over just, just a street up. How many Christians do you know? We know a bunch. Hundreds. And that's only a quarter of a million people. The world is not ready for the revelation. The signs that we see in this wicked world relate to the revelation. And it says, as it was in the days of Noah, then I will come to this earth and literally destroy it. Because he's going to destroy the earth and give us a new heaven and a new earth. That's what the signs are for. So what does this say about us and what should we do in light of the fact that Jesus said, I'm coming back. And what do I want and what do I expect and hope to accomplish with a message like this? What's next? The next thing that could happen at any moment without any signs or any fanfare except the trump of God and the voice of God, the dead in Christ will rise first and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, he talks about it in 1 John. Chapter 3. Dear friends, verse 2, we are now children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. And, and it says, in other words, the only thing we can know about our, our raptured bodies is what Jesus talked about when he was talking to the church and he talked about his glorified body. And what is that? Just like I said, I've always, as a young man, as a kid especially, that Jesus is coming and we're going to be like Jesus and we can walk through walls that, and I'll have x-ray vision, vision. That's probably not a good thing to give to a young man. But uh, uh, just being honest, folks, what's that glorified body going to be like? He says, we don't know, but we know. It will be a heavenly body. When he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then he says this. Everyone who has this hope in him, that's us. We have this hope. It's a blessed assurance that Jesus is coming again. And, and we believe it. He says everyone who has this hope purifies himself, even as he is pure. Huh. How pure is our life? 
How close do we walk with Jesus? How often have we forgotten the verse in Romans chapter 12 when he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And yet we fill our mind with garbage. One of my favorite Psalms is, is back in the Psalm, Psalm 103, I think it is. And David is telling that I will no vile thing before my eyes. And yet we will sit and watch garbage on our television at home. <laughs> I was fortunate. Marilyn was fortunate. In our homes, our folks didn't allow us to have garbage in our house. They wouldn't let us. I, I couldn't go to a movie. I still feel guilty when I go to a show today. It's not so much the movie. We can pick and choose what we want, want to watch. But you get those trailers. And David said, I'll allow no vile thing before my eyes. I will live blamelessly at home. Oh, that's what he's talking about. Blamelessly at home. We all have spouses or have had spouses or boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever else. Now, I'd like to tell you that I'm the perfect husband. Don't say it. <laughs> I'm not. I would like to think that when I die, Marilyn could say he's blameless because he always sought to be forgiven. I don't want, blameless means to be without guilt, and you can't get without guilt unless you've been forgiven. Folks, this Christianity thing, talking about Jesus coming again, it should motivate us. We haven't been apart very, <clears throat> very many times in our marriage life. I, I used to go to a conference, it was, I was gone five nights at a time, or, or, or she's, she has to go shopping with Linda a couple times a year, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm home alone. And, uh, but I, I never know what time she's coming home. Depends on when they run out of money. But uh, she's coming home. But you know, I try to have the kitchen picked up. Why? Right, because she's coming home. I try to make the bed. Why? Because she's coming home. Jesus is coming. It's time we got serious about being blameless and pure. Now, theologically, Doctrinally, I know that when Jesus died on the cross and I trusted by faith in his gift of grace to me, he pronounced me righteous. He gave me his righteousness. As I stand before God, because God cannot look at sin, and so as I stand before God today, he doesn't see the wretched me who usually is not blameless. He sees me as righteous. But he expects me to be ready when he comes. Are you ready? Now, no, if you're not, you won't be. If you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior, he will receive you with glad arms because he only sees the sin that has been forgiven and all of it has been. Past, present, and future. But in the meantime, because we are left here. There are no signs left to be fulfilled. He asks us to live like Him. Be like Jesus, this is my song. Be like Jesus all day long. Be ready. Be pure. Because He's coming again. I'd like to ask, ask you to stand and sing with me. Jesus is coming again. I think that's the song, isn't it, Carol? Coming again. It's number 250 in the hymn book. It's on the screen. Coming again.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Thank you that you have promised to come again and receive us unto yourself. Help us to be pure as you are pure. Holy because you are holy. And live our life to God's glory and for our good. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of your spirit guide our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus now and forever.